Darwin knew that his book might send shockwaves, challenging the most basic assumptions of the Christian faith, and it did. When he published On the Origin of Species, his wife Emma feared for his reputation. One of Darwin's most influential mentors, Adam Sedgwick, lamented, I have read your book with more pain than pleasure. Parts I read with absolute sorrow because I think them utterly false and grievously mischievous. Many of your wide conclusions are based upon assumptions which can neither be proved nor disproved. Why then express them in language and arrangements of philosophical induction? Darwin's path was this. Compromise in the authority of scripture gave way to skepticism. Skepticism to disbelief, and disbelief to open hostility to the God of Scripture. In his autobiography, Darwin would declare, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true, for if so, the plain language of the text seemed to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished, and this is a damnable doctrine. In the year 1860, just six months after the publication of Darwin's landmark work, a famous debate took place in Oxford, England, between Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, son of William Wilberforce, the famous liberator of the slave trade in England, and Darwin's protege, the wildly popular religious cynic Thomas Huxley. The heated debate over Darwin's new theory of evolution raged for hours. Sir? I would rather be descendant of a monkey than to use my gifts of oratory to spread lies! Lies! Lies, sir! You're saying that the word of God is lies? Then, to everyone's shock and surprise, an older man rose in the midst of the emotionally charged room, and it's reported that he held a heavy Bible over his head and implored the audience to believe God rather than man. The Bible-carrying man was none other than Admiral Robert Fitzroy, the former captain of the HMS Beagle and the five-year travel companion of Charles Darwin himself. Gentlemen! Ladies, I beg of you, believe God rather than man. Twenty-five years ago, I captained the ship that took Mr. Darwin to the Galapagos Islands. We spent five years together, and we came to vastly different conclusions. In the decades following the now famous voyage that brought these men around the world and to the Galapagos, Fitzroy had become a passionate Christian, a humanitarian, and a defender of the Genesis account of origins. After the publication of On the Origin of Species, Fitzroy forever regretted bringing Darwin to the Galapagos. In a private letter to Darwin, Julius Carus wrote, I shall never forget that meeting of the combined sections of the British Association when at Oxford in 1860, where Admiral Fitzroy expressed his sorrow for having given you the opportunities of collecting facts for such a shocking theory such as yours. Captain Robert Fitzroy walked where Charles Darwin walked. Like Darwin, he acted as a lay naturalist, collecting the flora and the fauna of the Galapagos. But even though Fitzroy witnessed the same things as Darwin, he reached vastly different conclusions. And so do we. Darwin died on April 19, 1882, and nowhere is the antithesis between Christianity and evolution more clear than in the face of death. On the Galapagos, we see it all around us. In the evolutionary worldview, the death of animals and humans is the basis for progress, the hope that evolution will continue through the survival of the fittest. But from the Bible's perspective, death is a consequence of man's sin against God. It's the penalty for disobedience, and the hope of redemption from death is found in the gospel, which places man's hope in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who overcame death by laying down his life as a perfect sacrifice. Uh, evolution is survival of the fittest. In Christianity, the most fit of all, Jesus Christ, died for the unfit. That's you and me. That's the way God thinks. That's the way the Creator thinks. 